I thought it was too. So how how old are you guys? I've, I've always been curious to know. Anybody here 20 years old or younger? What? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, 20 years, <laughs> twice. Now, 18, 19, how about 20 or older? And if you have a 25 or older, how about 25 times 2 or older? Yeah, so my, my son, Benjamin, he met my long-haired hippie son. He turned 30 this past week. Uh, man, he got old, but, how, but I didn't change. I mean, how, it's, it's interesting. He, he, he got 30. I'm going to be 30 almost the second time around here pretty soon. I'll be 30 for the second time in about two years. I'll, I'll be 60. So that's twice. But uh, Benjamin, he, he's, a, he's a musician, right? He, he, he gets commissioned to write these compositions. And so he works really hard to try and match words to music or music to words or both. So it's all about expression. It's all about how I get this across just right. How do I match this? And he was given a commission about three months ago, and he was supposed to write this this uh, not an etude. That's a practice. It's a, some sort of a, a, a piece to match up with an Edgar Allan Poe poem. A guy gave him a poem, and he worked and worked, but he wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with it, and didn't you know. About Two days before the deadline, they changed the poem, and instantly he could do it. But what was interesting to me was to watch him wrestle with how he was going to express this poem using this kind of music. What's also interesting to me is that Jesus is 30 years old. He's the same age as my son Benjamin. Huh. I'm thinking, I remember when I turned 30, I mean, I better get serious about life. Jesus did his best work when he was 30. I better be work hard. So I remember when I was 30, but now I can see my long-haired hippie son. Probably Jesus was long-haired hippie looking too, I don't know. <laughs> but Jesus wrestles with the same thing that my son Benjamin wrestles with. In Mark chapter 4, we get a really... Cool. We get a really, really cool picture of Jesus being very human. We'll, get, we'll see him wrestle. We'll see him struggle. You know, the, the guy's God for crying out loud. Why can't he just zap for things and make it happen? But he doesn't. I mean, he made us, right? He made you. All right, that's what I want you to do. Okay. But he doesn't do it. He wrestles. I mean, it's, he struggles. We even see him almost get irritated. Isn't that interesting? Jesus getting irritated. Can you get irritated and not sin? Well, of course you can, because he did, and he didn't. So, it, it's Mark chapter 4 is, is very, very interesting to me, because I can see Jesus' youth, or his age, because I can see it in my son. I see him struggle the same way my son struggled. I see him wrestle. I see him get things. My son, he paints too, when he paints. And so he's got this model, and he painted this model. And he wanted this model to do something, not take off her clothes, because it's like a 60 year old woman. <laughs> and so he's wanted to paint her, and he wants her to do something, and she doesn't want to do it. And so they go back and forth. And he's trying to make a point with her, and she doesn't want the point to be made. He gets mad, he punches a hole in the screen. Now, see, that's irritation gone too far, of course, where he actually violently attack this, not the woman, but this, this screen. And so we, we see Jesus have that same struggle going on, the same kind of struggle, where he's trying to get a point across, but they're just not getting it. Isn't that interesting? We will see Jesus in Mark chapter 4 more human than we've been able to see him yet, but not nearly as human as we're going to see him next week and the week after that. The more we study Mark, the more we realize that Jesus was a person just like us. And he wrestled with the things just like we do. But he never was beaten by it. I think that's cool. So four things 
Jesus knew he knew about the success of the church. Yeah, Amy and I, we were So, again, Jesus began to teach, it says. Again, Jesus began to teach. Remember a, a couple weeks ago, I said, you can put emphasis on different words, and it sounds different. It's the same sentence, but it's the, 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 the nuance is different. But I can say, again, Jesus was teaching. Or I can say, again, Jesus was teaching. Or I can say, again, Jesus began to teach. So you can see there's an emphasis. Of, the emphasis here is on teaching. The actual word, again, Jesus began to be teaching. He's teaching, again, for people, down by the lake. And we know that Jesus hangs out by the lake. And there's, there's a crowd that gathered around him, so large. We've seen this crowd before, right? They're running around the lake. They, 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 they smother him. They fall down at him. They chase him to Peter's house. They overtake the house. They surround him by circles. They go back out. It's that same crowd, except it's getting bigger and bigger. So big, the crowd was so large, he had to get into a boat. You remember I drew the character for boat? This is big boat, not little boat. Jesus is in a big boat. This is probably one of Peter's. Or maybe it would be Peter's boat. I mean, you know, this is Peter's telling the story, right? He's, he's, he's in my boat. He's, and so Jesus is in the boat, and he set it out on the lake. So we can see the boat anchored out here. And there's a space of water in between. And the crowd's all out here, all along the shore. Because if he doesn't do that, they're just going to mob him and push him into the drink. So he has to sit out here where the, where the boat's anchored out so that they can hear him. And so you've got the, the sea here, so you've got the acoustics. See, Jesus, Jesus is no dumb. I, I, I like that part about Jesus. He can, he's totally practical. He totally makes do with what he has and makes it work, too. I, I like that about Jesus. He makes things work. And he could have said, I need a sound system. I don't have a sound system. I'm not speaking today. Or, I don't have this. I don't have that. We don't get this. I'm not going to do it. Unless... No, Jesus totally makes things work. So he's sitting out there in the boat. And all the people, well, all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. And again, he talked. He was teaching them many things. Now, that's, that's, that's just a very simple sound. He's teaching them many things. Why didn't he just tell them one thing and they get it? Right? Back, back to the point where Jesus made us. Why doesn't he just tell us what he wants us to know? And why don't we just get it? He's perfect. He's the creator of the universe. He created people. He knows our psyche. He, he, he molded us. He can count how many hairs we got on our heads. Some of it's easier than other people. But Jesus knows everything about everybody. Why doesn't he just tell you what you need to know and you get it the first time? But he, but he doesn't, or he can't. Why? Wow, he can't. There's something Jesus cannot do in his humanly, physical way. Wow. That's fantastic. So he's teaching them many things by parables. He throws out these parables. It's like a, it's, it's like a, I forget the, who, who's that guy who tells Fable, like a fable, where you tell a story that makes a point at the end. It's got a model. So he throws out this concrete, it's called a concrete illustration with a point. That's what a parable means. It means to throw it out. Throw something out there that you can make a point. So he teaches them many, many things in parables. And in his teaching, this is the third time in two sentences, or in two verses. And in his teaching, the emphasis is on teaching, Jesus says, this is a very famous parable. We all know this parable. If you've been in church for any length of time, we all know this parable. So I'm going to try not to talk about the parable, but rather talk about Jesus. Remember, we're trying to learn what kind of person is Jesus so that we can be like him. Jesus says, listen. I think that's cool. Pay attention. He says, a farmer went out to sow his seed. He is scattering the seed. Some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it. Some fell on the rocky places, where it did not have much stuff. So now it says that Jesus makes a distinction between he scatters his seed, some fell along the path, some fell on the rocky places, because nobody in their right mind would sow seed on rocky places, would they? They wouldn't do that. It would fall there. You throw the seed, some of it would go where it's supposed to, and some of it just kind of falls where it's not supposed to go. See, Jesus is no doubt. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly. 
because the soil was shallow, you know, rocks like that. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they would, so I can watch me with like this, because they had no root. All well, that makes pretty much sense. Other seed, you know, there's the same kind of seed, but other parts of that seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. The actual word here is smother. See, if you were smothered under a bunch of pillows, you would it choke, get the same result. So the thorns are smothering the plants so they didn't bear any grain. Still, other seed, it's the same seed, but other kinds of, I mean, other parts of the same kind of seed, not, not a different kind of seed, that's important. It wasn't like Jesus told some people this and told different people that, or told people different something. It's the same seed, but in other places, fell on good soil, it came up, it grew, and produced a crop. Some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Well, that all makes sense. We don't even need that to be explained to us, maybe. Then Jesus says, whoever has ears, the actual word is sits. Since you have ears, have I got ears in here? Yeah, it looks like it. Since you've got ears, listen. Hear up, he says. Let them hear. Then he was alone. The twelve. These are the same twelve. Remember, we just chose them. Jesus was up all night on the mountains. He took from the crowd. He chose those twelve. These are the apostles. Peter, James, John, Andrew. And remember how they all turned out. Jesus is pretty good at picking out who he wants to be his loyal followers. We know how that works. Those guys. Those guys. And look, and there were some other people around him also. Ask him about the parables. Now the emphasis here is just as soon as they got off by themselves, they asked him this question. Right? So they're not going to ask him in front of the crowd, a whole big crowd of people, and Jesus is talking in parables, and whoa, Jesus, we didn't quite get that. Could you explain that to us? They're not going to do that. Well, we're the chosen ones. We should know what he's talking about, but they don't. So just as soon as they get alone, the twelve and a few others ask him about the parables. He, he tells them, this is, this is one. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those who are on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Sounds pretty unfair to me. What Jesus is telling the twelve, we got a secret handshake going on here. That's what he said. You guys got the secret, he tells them. Hmm. So what happens is the twelve are given an insight that the others don't get that. So they can like talk in code words. Does anybody here got boyfriend and girlfriend? You know, boyfriend and girlfriend stuff? Like Chang's got a wife. Do you, do you call her something that only she knows? That you would call her that? Not really. Lie to us and say yes. Okay. <laughs> no, but you, you get the idea. You've got a communication. The, the more you know somebody, the easier it is to communicate with them in less words. We kind of we kind of get that. You guys think you, you've got this camaraderie, you've got this this mojo going on. That's what Jesus is saying here. You guys, they, you guys get the secret of the kingdom of God. He says, I'm going to explain to you what I mean by those secrets here. You get things in parables, and you're going to be able to understand these parables, where everybody else is going to wonder what in the world we're talking about. I'm going to talk to you openly, but nobody else is going to get it. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is forming a bond here with his twelve. So, Jesus said to him, this is, this is the part where, you know, what? Don't, don't you understand this parable? That's, that's what, don't, what do you mean? Even we can get it. I mean, what's 2,000 years removed? Yes, yeah, so this seed, that works. Yeah, so that seed, that's going to turn out that way. We can, we can pretty much guess what's going on here, but they couldn't get it. He said, what? Don't you understand this parable? How will you understand any parable? Can you, you can hear frustration here. Can't, you can hear Jesus say, what? How, you, you don't get it? I thought we had something going on here. I thought you guys were privy to my secrets. I thought if I talked about kingdom stuff, you'd get it. And they're not. He said, okay, let me explain this to you. The farmer sows the word. 
That would be the word of God, of course. Some people are like seed along the path, and here we get that, where the word is sown. Yeah, people out there, as soon as they hear it, Satan comes. They might say, boo. Satan, boo. Yeah, you guys don't hate him very much, do you? But in this very, very simple sentence, in this very, very simple sentence, Jesus makes it crystal clear. There is a devil. And his name is Satan. So, someone asked, that, is there a hell? Is there evil? Is there bad? Yes, the answer is yes. There's a devil. His name is Satan. Ha, He's the evil one. He is bent on doing things that are evil. I think that's my mother. No, I'm kidding. She's evil. Jesus said there is an evil person out there. He's all he wants is for you to do evil things too. He's lost, there is hopeless. His only joy is to make you in a hopeless situation as well. There are such people who are so unhappy, the only way they can be happy is to make you more unhappy than they are. That's the devil. He is lost. And his only joy, if you could call it joy, his only purpose in existence is to bring other people into a lost situation. That's the devil. Satan. Jesus calls him by name. He exists. It's not a figment of some imagination. This is not the parable. This is the explanation. There is a devil. Satan comes and takes away the word. No, Satan doesn't work on your heart. He doesn't. Satan cannot do anything to me. Go for it, dude. Not get away from me, Satan. Resist the devil. He flees from you, the Bible says. The devil cannot do anything to you, but he can mess around with the word. He can mess around with how clearly it is delivered. He can mess around with whether you understand these things. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on wacky places, hear the word, and at once, oh, hey, 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 with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble, persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Hmm, we can't get that. Yeah, you know, I'll be a Christian as long as things are good, but when things are bad, I don't want to do that anymore. Still, others, same word, different people, right? Like seed sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life. Amy and I were talking, she was chilling this week, didn't worry about anything. Right? Yeah. But sometimes we, sometimes we can't chill. Sometimes we really work. Sometimes, you know, tests or jobs or budgets. So sometimes things bother us. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires, desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Hmm. See, you know, when we read this, we immediately try to decide which one of these types are we. Right, we all think, which one am I? Am I on a rocky place? Did he just miss me altogether? Am I being choked by desires? Am I going to be the guy who 30, 60, 100 falls? We try and put ourselves in one of those, and, and that's, that's a good exercise. But that's not the point here. The point here is Jesus says the word is being sown, and it's going to be received in different ways. Others, like the seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times. What is so? Jesus makes it perfect. I mean, it, he clearly wants to tell us that the word of God will be sown, and it's going to be received in different ways. That's the point. The word of God gets sown, it gets spread, and then people receive it in different ways. So we're going to ask ourselves, which one of the receptors are we? Or are we a sower? Right? Are we a sower? Here's something I know I know. Number one. Not everyone responds the same to the word of God. Well, you think, well, duh. But, you know, we're, 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 some of us are business people. And we, we, we're trying to sell a product. Maybe we're trying to, you know, to market. We're trying to reach a, a large group of people with a single product. Well, not everybody's going to receive it the same way. Well, of course not. 
What we want to do is send this out and get everybody. It doesn't work that way. Jesus is making it perfectly clear that when he spreads the word, and we're talking about the kingdom of God, he knows that even he, even Jesus, who can control people's hearts because he made them, cannot determine who's going to receive and how it's going to be received. Hmm. But everyone would respond if what, if what? We sow the seeds. Now they're not all going to respond positively, but everybody gets a chance to respond. You see, the onus, the responsibility is for us to sow. Not everyone responds the same, but everybody will respond in some manner if we so. Then he said to them, <laughs> this, this is fun for me, I like this one. Do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? Now, you know, oh, what's so cool about that? Actually, I don't know about your sense of humor, but this is funny. Jesus doesn't say, you don't bring in a lamp. Jesus is saying, a lamp doesn't come in by itself. So you want to picture a lamp suddenly sprouting feet and arms. It said lamps don't just come in all by themselves and hide under a bed, do they? Sam, we gotta, I gotta, I'll show you a picture of this. This is this one. We need some sound here, too. I got me a picture of a living lampstand. I think I have a picture of a living lampstand. Okay, everybody look over there. Yeah, there we go, there we go. Let's broaden this picture up here. Picture of a living lampstand. I think this is what... Oh, <laughs> I find a glass of water crust of bread. Hey, Marcus, what? I am surprised at you. She's not a prisoner. She's our guest. We must make her feel welcome here. Right this way, mademoiselle. Bottom right hand down. corner. Big screen. If the master finds out about this, it will be called down, 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 down. Of course, of course. But what is dinner without a little music? Music? Ma chère mademoiselle, it is with deepest pride and greatest pleasure that we welcome you tonight. And now, we invite you to relax. Let us pull up a chair as the dining room proudly presents your dinner. Be our guest. Be our guest. Put our service to the test. Tie your napkin around your neck, sherry, and we provide the rest. Soup to draw, hot or dirt. Why, we only live to serve. Try the grace to Okay, that's enough. Delicious. That's, that's enough. Don't believe me. There he is. Free you. Then the mystery is revealed. That's what it's a mystery. 
A secret exposed is what a mystery. So whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If you have ears, we all have ears, let them hear. Jesus is saying this word of God that we have is meant to be exposed. It's meant to be delivered. Whoa. Consider carefully what you hear, he says. With the measure you use, they will be measured to you. And even more, whatever you've been given, you'd better use well. If you've been given affluence, if you're rich, make sure you're using that money. If you have a lamp, make sure you're using that lamp for people to see. Jesus is what has been given to you, make sure you use that, and even more. Because what you have been given, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they do have, will be taken away. With diligence, with diligence and hard work, we can see good results. With negligence, things become bare, he says. Things I know, I know. The message of the church is meant to be shared. Listen, we have a responsibility here. If, if Sunday's where we like to hang out, that's cool. But it goes beyond that. We know about the kingdom of God. We have this mystery that the world is waiting to learn about, that what? God loves everybody. We are all one family. It's called the kingdom of God. We know things that people in the world don't know. We know things. It's been entrusted to us. We have a responsibility to share this. The message of the church is meant to be shared. We need to share it. If you went, if you go home and say, wow, I watched Beauty and the Beast in church this morning, wasn't that cool? This afternoon wasn't that cool. You missed the point. That's not the point. The point is we are to be living lampstands. We are not meant to go hide under a bed. We have this responsibility. We, this, this, this onus has been placed on our backs. So let's go do this. Now, go. Go do that. Jesus wants to say. Number three is my favorite. There are four of them. Right? Number, number three is my favorite. He also said, Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Oh, well, we got that. All right, hey. Now, here's where it's fun. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how to hurt. Now, what's so cool about that? Night and day, whether he's sleeping or getting up, he sows. The seed sprouts and grows. Jesus is speaking to the Christians. He's talking to us about an extreme effort that is required on our part. Jesus expects us to be hard-working people. He wants us to work hard. You see that it's something we will do night and day. And it's something we will do whether we're sleeping, whether we're getting up. It's going to be a persistence. I love the word. We love the word persistence. It's going to be enduring. It's something we want to be enduring. We want to be going at this like more and more and more. And the seed will sprout. What's in time? Jesus says, if you work hard, the seed will sprout. It will grow. You put the seed in the ground, it's going to grow. Though nobody knows how that happens. Now, isn't that interesting? Farmers don't know how it happens. They don't know how it happens. Scientists don't know how that happens. How how do they do that? But the seed is going, look at that. How big, how big? Yeah, can't figure that out. You know, I am not a botanist by any means. In fact, I'm dumber than a tree sometimes. But I have learned, and I don't know if I can say this right, but in the roots of trees, under the ground, in the roots of trees, each root on a plant has something similar to a little follicle, like a follicle of hair. They're little bubbles, little bitty, 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 tiny bubbles on the molecular level. And they all hang around on the roots of plants. And what they do is they throb. You know, when you hit your hand, and it just throbs, the pain throbs. It's kind of like a rhythmic throb. And they do this in order, like a concert. So all the follicles on the roots of trees will throb at different times. And then they will open up, they will take in sustenance, they will feed, and then they will close up, and then they will grow while they're 
above the ground, they're sucking in CO2 and producing oxygen so that we, you see, all of this entire thing is going on in, in beautiful harmony while we, night and day, eat or sleep, get up, whatever, it just keeps going. The entire universe works in perfect harmony, specifically the plants work in perfect harmony from the get-go. How do we know that? Because, because how do we know that? Because Jesus made it. This is, this is the best word in the whole Mark chapter 4. You know, all by itself. The soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. The word, all by itself. Now, if this doesn't get your blood curdling, if this, if this phrase doesn't get you excited, nothing in the world will ever get you excited. All by itself. The Greek word for all by itself is automate. Automate. We can hear automate. Automatically. Jesus has created the universe and put it on automatic. That is cool. The world is on automatic. That's how it works. He made it that way. Jesus says, I know that if I put a seed in the ground, it will grow up like this. I just know that will do this. It's on automatic. I made it that way. I, Jesus, I made it that way. The church will do the same thing. He knows the church will grow. Just like he is 100% confident that the, se that the seasons will come. There is fall, and then comes winter, then comes spring, then comes summer, then comes fall, then comes winter, then comes spring, then comes summer. Just as automatic as the seasons are, the plants grow. Just as automatic as the seasons are, the church will grow. Jesus has made a prediction that the church will grow. And how did that turn out for him? Did the church grow? Indeed it did. The church will grow. It is guaranteed. The real test is, what part do we want to play in whether the church will grow or not? What's your part? What are you doing for the church? And then the last one. And again he said, again he said, fourth point. What shall we say? The kingdom of God is like... Or what parable shall we use to describe? It's like a mustard seed. Do you know how big a mustard seed is? Mustard seed is about as big as the tip of my pen. See it? You all see the tip of the pen? Right there. A little bit smaller, really. But that's how big a mustard seed is. Which is the smallest of all seeds on earth? It's the smallest of all garden seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. Hmm. A mustard plant. Which, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. No matter how tiny the beginning, no matter how tiny the beginning, whether it's just one man from Nazareth who chose 12 men and grew a church that reached its 2.6 billion people over the course of 1,000, 2,000 years, no matter how insignificant or tiny the beginning is, it's going to grow. If we sow the seed, if we announce His living lamb stands, and if we are enduringly trusting in His ability to make these things happen, from the tiniest beginning, it can grow. Watch this, I can grow into a mustard tree. I really can't do that. What are you looking at? <laughs> mustard trees are about 8 feet, 60, 6 to 8 feet tall. So imagine, long, long time ago, I was just about the size of the tip of my pen, right? And now, see, I did I went from mustard seed to, this is how big trees get. Except Jesus says, no matter how insignificant the beginning, the church will grow large enough that even the birds can perch in its shape. Number one, the church will grow large enough. It's the finish that matters. It's how things turn out that matters. And then many other things. Jesus spoke many similar parables. Same stories. I mean, same point, different stories. Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. And 
and they didn't understand. And so he explains, he did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained. Explained means to untie. He unloosed the complications. It's like their secrets bundled up in their head. He untied them and opened them up, is what explained. He opened up the secrets to everybody. What kind of Jesus? Jesus is a teacher. Jesus is a teacher, right? He's persistent again and again and more than many, night and day, up and sleeping, uh, creative. Look at how the man finds different ways to get the same point across, right? Wise, hanging out on that boat, keep from being trampled, keep from being made seashellish, uh, deep. There are some deep thoughts to be thunk if we were to examine these parables in, in depth. Knowledgeable? Look at the guy. The, the, what do you guys know about farming? I don't know, squat. The only thing I know about farming are things that Jesus taught me, right? Appealing? The guy has great appeal. How do you, how do you present yourself as a Christian to those around you? Commanding? Listen. If you've got ears, listen up. Did you hear what I said? Don't you understand? Understanding. When the disciples, the apostles didn't get it, held their hands, took them back, explained things to them. Human. Very, very human. Jesus was very, very human. Don't think for a moment that Jesus had superpowers and that's why he never sinned. That's not true. Jesus didn't rely on his superpowers to keep from sin. He was human. And he still didn't sin. Funny. I thought it was funny. You know, I, th I thought it was what did you say the name of Duvier? Duvier? Duvier, yeah. yeah. Inclusive. I didn't point that out. There was one point. How, how shall we, like we, Jesus says, how shall we? You see, rabbis never did that before. Jesus calls his crowd into how shall we do something? He includes his crowd in there. Deep? Oh, I think I said that. Confident? Of course he's confident. He made it. Intriguing. Intriguing. There's something worth digging into. Something, something there, mysterious about Jesus. Memorable. Memorable. Can you name the nine fruit of the Spirit? Can you tell me the twelve Beatitudes? Can't remember all of them. We can remember some of them, but we can remember these four stories, right? We can remember stories. Jesus makes it memorable for us. Let's pray. We love you very much, Jesus. We want to be like you. Thank you for putting the world on automatic. Thank you for knowing how things work. Thank you for having confidence in how things play out. Lord, thank you for making such a clear prediction of the church. Yeah, if we just sow it, if, we, if, the, if the word is sown and then we just keep doing it and we do it diligently, it will grow from the tiniest beginning up in the size of a big tree with people and birds and everything to live in it. Lord, you predicted the church would do this and my God, it turned out just the way you said it would. We love you for that. We thank you for being our master. We thank you for being our teacher. We thank you for being our king. We thank you for being our Lord. Lord, we thank you for giving us a spirit so that we can be more like you. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand for a close praise.